In this talk, we'll go through helpful fundamentals to know when approaching bone x-rays. Let's begin with a brief review of anatomy and nomenclature. Long bones are generally divided into three main regions. The diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. The epiphyses are the rounded ends of the bone, and usually the sites where the bone will articulate with other bones. And the metaphyses are the regions between the diaphysis and epiphyses. In children, a cartilage layer known as the epiphyseal plate or growth plate exists at each metaphyseal epiphyseal junction and is responsible for bone lengthening during growth. In adulthood, the epiphyseal or growth plates ossify into epiphyseal lines. The surfaces where the epiphyses contact another bone are covered by a layer of hyaline cartilage, which reduce wear and tear by providing a smooth, low friction surface that allows bones to glide smoothly against each other during movement. The hyaline cartilage also absorbs and helps distribute mechanical loads more uniformly across the surface of the entire epiphysis. Now let's look at a longitudinal cross-section through the bone and the two types of bone tissue. Cortical or compact bone is of high density, mostly responsible for bone strength, and appears homogeneously white on x-ray. And medullary bone, which is less dense and appears light gray on x-ray with a fine trabecular pattern. When we encounter a bone lesion, its location within cortical versus medullary bone tissue can sometimes be a helpful clue with regards to its differential diagnosis. A thin several cell layer thick membrane known as periosteum covers every surface of a bone except for the areas covered by hyaline cartilage. Whenever cortical bone is insulted and the periosteum is torn, stretched, or inflamed, a periosteal reaction may occur, which lays down a new layer of bone that's often visible on x-ray. Bones articulate at joints, and these joints are held together by a joint capsule and ligaments. A small amount of synovial fluid produced by a thin layer of cells lining the joint space called synovial membrane, is also present within the joint space, which further reduces friction along the articulating bone surfaces. When you're interpreting a bone x-ray image, try approaching it conceptually as three tasks, bone assessment, joint assessment, and soft tissue assessment. When assessing bone, four things to check for will be periosteal reaction, cortical integrity, unusual density changes, and intact medullary texture. Whenever cortical bone experiences an insult, like a fracture, infection, or tumor, and the periosteum gets focally elevated, a periosteal reaction may occur, which lays down new bones superficial to the existing cortical bone surface. The appearance of this new bone is influenced by how intense or aggressive the insult was and how long it lasted for. Non-aggressive insults generally result in periosteal reaction patterns that appear thin or solid, while aggressive insults may result in laminated onion skin, perpendicular hair on end, or sunburst periosteal reaction patterns. If an aggressive process evolves so fast that the periosteum can barely lay down any new bone at all, only the margins of the raised periosteum may ossify. When this little bit of ossification is seen tangentially on an x-ray, it forms a small angle with the surface of the bone, resulting in a feature known as a Codman triangle. When you notice the presence of periosteal reaction on a bone x-ray, It's an important hint that there's been some sort of cortical bone insult, and the periosteal reaction pattern may help suggest if the insult was non-aggressive, like a recent fracture, a benign bone lesion, or chronic osteomyelitis, or if the insult was aggressive, like acute osteomyelitis or a malignant bone tumor. After you check for periosteal reaction, Check the integrity of the cortical bone for any evidence of fracture. Are the cortical margins entirely smooth and uninterrupted, 
Or do you see focal disruption or crumpling of the cortical margin, like in this child's distal radius? Or has a fracture resulted in a cortical bone discontinuity that looks like a dense line on x-ray because the cortical bone on both sides of the fracture plane slightly overlap? Or is there a lucent line because cortical bone on both sides of the fracture plane are now slightly distracted from each other? When assessing for fractures, remember that a single view can sometimes tell a misleading story. For a diagnostic assessment for bone fracture, do not settle for less than two different and preferably orthogonal views. And if you see a fracture, try to describe these six attributes of the fracture. The fracture's age. With an acute fracture, the bone disruption will appear fresh with sharp edges along the break and no callus bridging the fracture plane. With a subacute fracture, typically a few weeks to a few months old, the lucent fracture line will still be visible, but around one to two millimeters of bone resorption has now occurred along both sides of the fracture plane, resulting in a fracture line that appears more indistinct. You may also see early callus formation beginning to bridge the fracture plane as well. With a chronic fracture, the bone along both sides of the fracture plane will usually have fused, and a lucent fracture line is no longer visible. Smooth callus and remodeling may have also occurred, resulting in a localized deformity in the shape or contour of the bone. Describe the fracture type. Some fractures, particularly those in kids, may not result in a clean break and are incomplete. Folks sometimes call these green stick fractures. Most fractures, however, are complete. Complete fractures are subdivided by how the fracture plane runs. If this is a complete fracture, is it transverse, oblique, spiral, or longitudinal? Share if there's any evidence of direct bone exposure to the environment by describing the fracture as closed if no fracture fragment has breached the skin and the fracture site is therefore sterile, or open if there's evidence a fracture fragment has breached the skin surface, meaning that the fracture site may no longer be sterile. Describe the number of fracture fragments. Simple fractures result in only two fragments, one on each side of the fracture plane. If more than two fragments are present, the fracture is comminuted. Describe the location of the distal fracture fragment relative to the proximal fracture fragment. If the distal fracture fragment is displaced, describe the direction and amount of displacement. If the distal fracture fragment is angulated relative to the proximal fragment, Describe the direction the distal end of the distal fracture fragment is angled towards. Describe if the distal fracture fragment overlaps the proximal fragment. If there's overlap, describe the amount. Describe if the distal fracture fragment appears to have rotated relative to the proximal fragment, like in this oblique proximal right humeral fracture. Finally, describe if there's joint involvement by the fracture plane. Intraarticular fractures, like this one, extend into a joint space and may substantially affect joint function, lead to accelerated arthritis, and often may require open reduction and internal fixation. After you check for cortical integrity, check for any unusual density changes in the bone. Density change can be diffuse or localized, and the density change can be increased or decreased relative to normal bone. If density change is diffusely increased, consider disorders like renal osteodystrophy and malignancy. There are a number of unusual bone diseases that can cause diffuse bone density increase too. If the bone density is diffusely 
decreased, consider osteoporosis. Here's an example of diffusely increased bone density in the setting of metastatic prostate cancer to bone. Here's an example of diffusely increased bone density in the setting of a rare bone disease known as osteopetrosis. And here's an example of diffusely decreased bone density in the setting of osteoporosis. Notice how the cortical bone appears thinner too. When the density change is localized, always remember to consider tumor regardless if you observe localized density increase or decrease. Here's an example of localized increased bone density in the setting of metastatic prostate cancer to the lumbar spine. And here's an example of localized decreased bone density in the setting of a primary Ewing sarcoma in the tibia. When you encounter an apparent bone tumor on x-ray, do your best to judge if the bone tumor seems benign or malignant. Use some of the features on this table in aggregate to inform your opinion. The margin of most benign tumors are well-defined with a sharp, distinct border or transition zone between tumor and normal bone. Malignant bone lesions, on the other hand, often have ill-defined margins and a broad transition zone. Malignant bone tumors may also exhibit other concerning behaviors, such as cortical disruption and periosteal reaction. Cross-sectional imaging may also reveal an associated soft tissue mass or local invasion. Compare the sharpness of the margin and the distinct transition zone of the benign sclerotic bone tumor on the left image here versus the ill-defined margins of the malignant lytic bone tumor on the right image and how wide its transition zone is. Also, notice the subtle cortical destruct destruction that's occurred near the tip of the blue arrow and the pathologic fracture near the tip of the red arrow. With malignant bone tumors, metastatic disease to bone is much more common than malignant primary bone tumors. Lymphoma and prostate cancer metastases to bone are generally sclerotic, while melanoma and renal cell carcinoma metastases to bone tend to be lytic. Lung, breast, and thyroid cancer metastases to bone often may be both. There are other differential diagnoses for localized bone density change to consider besides just tumor. For example, with localized bone density increase, Remember to also consider metabolic disorders. While with localized bone density decrease, something I also may think about is osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis can be characterized as acute, subacute, or chronic. In acute osteomyelitis, the involved bone may often appear almost normal. Be prepared to sacrifice specificity for sensitivity or vice versa when you're reading x-ray images for acute osteomyelitis, since it's tough to have both. With subacute osteomyelitis, x-rays perform a little better. Look for focal bone density decrease, cortical destruction, and aggressive periosteal reaction patterns. With chronic osteomyelitis, x-rays may sometimes be less specific. Sequelae of chronic osteomyelitis may include focal bone lucency and sclerosis, and prior comparison x-rays can often be very helpful. With osteomyelitis, it's important to remember that x-rays tend to be of limited sensitivity and specificity. For us to call osteomyelitis on an x-ray, the infection needs to have progressed to a point where a substantial amount of bone has already been destroyed. MRI is usually a much better imaging exam for osteomyelitis than x-rays. That being said, x-rays are a much more accessible imaging study than MRI. After you check for unusual changes in bone density, check the medullary texture of the bone and its fine trabecular pattern. Sometimes, a focal disruption of the fine trabecular pattern might help you catch a subtle fracture you might have otherwise missed. Other times, Focal absence of the fine trabecular pattern 
just may help you catch a subtle localized bone lesion. After you complete the bone assessment, move on to the joint assessment, where you'll check joint alignment, the joint space, and for joint effusion. Joints are held together by a joint capsule and ligaments that are invisible on an x-ray image since they're of similar density as all the other soft tissues surrounding the bones. Sometimes a partial loss of integrity of these tissues may allow the bones at a joint to sublux and move out of their normal position, resulting in a loss of proper alignment. This sort of partial or incomplete dislocation can occur in the setting of things like trauma, repetitive stress, or ligament laxity. In a subluxation, the joint surfaces are not completely separated from each other. However, with more severe loss of ligament and joint capsule integrity, a complete joint dislocation may occur. Assessment of joint alignment, like assessment for fracture, requires at least two different and preferably orthogonal views. After you check joint alignment, check the joint space. Hyaline articular cartilage covers the surfaces where the bones articulate, and on an x-ray, the hyaline cartilage is radiolucent, so it appears as if there's a black gap where the bones articulate. If the hyaline cartilage is healthy and of normal thickness, the black gap between the bones on an x-ray image should appear uniform and of normal width. However, issues like mechanical stress, inflammation, aging, and genetic predisposition may over time cause the hyaline articular cartilage to gradually break down and wear away during the joint degenerative process we call arthritis. When this occurs, the cartilage loses its thickness and becomes thinner. Thinner hyaline cartilage means that the joint's ability to absorb shock and provide cushioning between the bones also decreases, which may cause the hyaline cartilage that remains to become rougher, which leads to additional friction whenever the joint moves, leading to more damage and more joint pain and stiffness. In advanced arthritis, bone-on-bone -bone contact may eventually occur, which can cause severe pain, limited mobility, and joint deformities. In response to the cartilage degeneration occurring in arthritis, the bones may respond by developing more cortical bone along the articular bone surfaces. The body may also attempt to repair the joint by forming bony outgrowths called osteophytes along the joint margins, which can further impede joint movement and contribute to pain and inflammation. All of these processes result in the typical x-ray imaging features of arthritis. Joint space narrowing increased sclerosis and cortical bone thickness at the articular bone surfaces, and osteophytes. And here's a pretty dramatic example of these type of changes in an arthritic knee joint. There are many different types of arthritis. Some arthritides are predominantly driven by inflammation, while others are predominantly driven by other factors. Common inflammatory arthritides include rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis was known as Reiter's syndrome or Reiter's disease for many years until folks in the medical community realized that Hans Reiter was not only a Nazi, but a member of the SS and a war criminal who conducted medical experiments at Buchenwald. Common non-inflammatory arthritides include osteoarthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, and gout. If you recognize that arthritis is present, its x-ray imaging features may offer you a hint as to whether you're dealing with an inflammatory or a non-inflammatory arthritis. Non-inflammatory arthritis tend to be asymmetric and involve distal joints, while inflammatory arthritis may cause bone destruction and joint fusion, which are pretty uncommon in the setting of non-inflammatory arthritis. After you check the joint space, check for joint effusion. In a normal joint, 
a small amount of synovial fluid is present within the joint space that reduces friction along the articulating bone surfaces. Sometimes, however, the amount of synovial fluid within the joint space may become abnormally increased, resulting in a joint effusion. Joint effusions, like the large knee joint effusion on this image, don't always jump out on an x-ray image since their density on x-ray images is similar to muscle. So we often need to rely on secondary signs. For example, a slightly dark gray prefemoral fat pad normally sits immediately anterior to the distal femur, which is what the blue arrows are pointing to, and a slightly dark gray infrapatellar fat pad normally sits inferior to the patella, which is what the purple arrow is pointing to. If we notice that these fat pads are missing or less conspicuous, like on the image on the left, something, like a joint effusion, may be pushing them aside. Yellow arrows here point to the suprapatellar component of this right joint effusion, and red arrows point to its infrapatellar um, component. Although joint effusions can be tough to see on x-rays, if you catch one, it's a clue that some sort of joint pathology may be present. After you complete the joint assessment, move on to the soft tissue assessment. Compared to cross-sectional imaging modalities like CT or MRI, x-rays are relatively insensitive and non-specific with regards to soft tissue problems. However, there are some items you should try to check for in the soft tissues, such as foreign bodies, abnormal calcifications, and air. And if you happen to have an x-ray image of the contralateral body part you're inspecting, and that contralateral side is unaffected, use it as a ground truth comparison for a more sensitive and specific assessment of the soft tissues.